The faith that we exercise in prayer is not faith in our own abilities, but it is faith in the God who sovereignly accomplishes his will. Do have a seat and we'll get going. Well, tonight we come to the, the last in our series on how to love one another. Uh, on and off since the start of April, we've been learning uh, about serving one another, welcoming one another, bearing each other's burdens, forgiving uh, one another, encouraging uh, one another to name uh, but a few. And uh, I, I, for one, have found it a helpful service, uh, a series. And uh, if you've missed any of them, I'm sure you will know that you can catch up online um, and uh, at clayton.tv and, and, and read some of the transcripts there. Well, we're concluding the series by looking at uh, what is um, arguably one of, one of the most important, praying for one another. So it may be helpful to have your Bibles open at uh, page 1013. That'll take you to James chapter 5. That's the section we're going we're gonna to work from uh, this evening. And uh, uh, the headings will be up uh, on the PowerPoint as we, as we go through. Now, many of us know that uh, when we come to talk to God, um, we should do so uh, in a certain attitude. We should do so in an attitude of, of respect and, and reverence and, and, and awe and, and, and praise. We also know that uh, we need to keep short accounts with God. And uh, so we, we try and confess our sins to him uh, regularly and, and sort of express our, great, uh, our gratitude uh, to him for his uh, forgiveness. And most of us probably, when it comes to the sort of request side of things, are, are quite quick on the uptake with prayers uh, for ourselves. We're conscious of what we need to pray for ourselves. Lord, help me to do this. Help me sort that out, whatever it might be. But when it comes to praying for each other, how do we, how do we fare? Our key verse tonight is James uh, 5.16, in which we are commanded to pray for one another. But there is a lot to unpick um, around that command. In full, the verse says this. This is uh, James 5, um, 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you might be healed. So if we, if we read those words in their uh, immediate context, we realize that they are set in the, uh, in the middle of an exhortation to pray in anticipation uh, of healing for those who are sick. And we'll come back to the specifics of that uh, in due course. But what I want us to remember at the start as we, as we work through these verses is the wider context of the whole New Testament, which makes it clear that the responsibility for Christians to pray for one another isn't just limited to sickness. So take, for example, the early church leader, Paul. Time and again, he pleads, brothers, pray for us. We heard that actually in the passage uh, this morning, if you were here, but it's like 1 Thessalonians 5 and others. And he doesn't just command that, he doesn't just say do it, he sets the example. So take Colossians uh, 1, he prays that believers would be filled with the knowledge of God's will, that they would have wisdom and understanding, that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, and being strengthened with all power. That, that's, that sounds like a pretty good prayer to pray, doesn't it? But it's not just Paul. Jesus himself asks uh, for, for prayers of his disciples. If you remember back to the Garden of Gethsemane, the night uh, before Jesus dies on the cross, what does he say to his disciples? Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Not that they were particularly successful in their endeavor that night. They kept falling asleep. We may be able to relate to that. But Jesus acknowledged that prayer is important. And then don't forget how Luke describes the characteristics of the early church in, his, in the book of Acts. He identifies four, four characteristics of the early church, one of which was that they devoted themselves to praying. So given that praying for one another is, is such an essential characteristic of being a Christian, I think it would be helpful to review this part of James that is before us, to understand more about what's involved in praying for each other, and then think more about how we actually do it. So firstly, what's involved in, in praying for one another? What's involved? And I think the first thing to note uh, from, from this uh, passage about praying for each other is that prayer covers every circumstance. Prayer covers every circumstance. Verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. 
Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So right there, in in three words, you have most of the range of human circumstance covered, whether it's suffering, whether it's being cheerful, or whether it's being sick. In, In other words, whether you're up, whether you're down, whether you're ill or whether you're healthy, any, every circumstance, prayer is appropriate. Why? Because James knows the spiritual reality that we need help in any circumstance because any circumstance can lead to spiritual upset. So for example, in times of suffering and trouble, we can doubt God, we can become discouraged, we can neglect prayer, sometimes we can give up meeting together. Firstly, in times of prosperity and ease, we can become lazy, we can become complacent. We come under the impression that actually we don't need God. Everything's all right. Thank you very much. But James says we need to remember that God is sufficient. He is all we need in any and every situation. Now, as a brief aside, the more observant uh, of you will notice here that uh, verse 13 is about us praying, praying ourselves. And verse 14 is about getting someone to pray for us in a specific circumstance. And that circumstance is a time of, of, of serious illness, sort of above average illness. There's enough here in this passage to suggest that we're not talking about a common cold or a headache or anything like that, but a time of serious illness when it is appropriate to ask for prayer from church leaders. That's a good and a, and a, and a, and a right thing to do. So can I say, if you, if you find yourselves physically or mentally laid low, confined to your bed, Uh, unable unable to move, unable to know what else to pray, weary, worn out, then call for prayer. Ask for prayer. We'd love to come and pray for you in in this more proactive way. We can bring oil. Don't worry about that. That's merely symbolic. It's just a a symbolism. There's nothing special in of, of the oil itself, but it is what James recommends. So praying should cover every circumstance. Second thing to note when thinking about how we pray for each other is that prayer includes physical and spiritual needs. Prayer includes both physical and spiritual needs. Look at verse 15. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now on first reading... People can get into a bit of a muddle about this verse, and I don't want to get too sidetracked, but we do need to deal with the issue. And the main misunderstanding on this verse is that God's healing is somehow dependent on the faith of the person praying. Therefore, the thinking goes, if if I'm not healed, it's because I didn't pray enough, or the person that was praying for me didn't pray enough, or, or hard enough, or didn't believe enough. But what James is actually trying to emphasize here is not our role in the praying equation, but God's role. So look back to, to verse uh, 14. It says, Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil, what? In the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Do you see that? The faith that we exercise in prayer is not faith in our own abilities but it is faith in the God who sovereignly accomplishes his will. Let me say that again. The faith that we exercise in prayer is not in our own abilities, but it is faith in the God who sovereignly accomplishes his will. And statements such as this one from James and others in the Bible are designed to give us the confidence to come to the Lord and to humbly ask him to meet both our physical needs and our spiritual needs. Of course, in his will, he he may not decide to heal, and it doesn't automatically follow that sickness is the direct result of personal sin. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And that's why James says, if, if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. But what we do learn here is that praying for each other can have both physical and spiritual benefits. Thirdly, we learn that praying for one another enables and restores true fellowship. This is verse, uh, I think, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another 
and pray for one another that you may be healed. If you like, this is where James uh, and his teaching on uh, about prayer in the sort of in the abstract, in the monochrome abstract, if you like, suddenly bursts into this glorious communal technicolor. He is concerned for our fellowship together as a family of believers. So prayer isn't just for the individual, as, he, as we saw in verse 13. It isn't just for the elders or the ministers, uh, verse 14. Prayer is for all of us. And James wants to encourage every one of us to pray in a genuine, honest, and, and a deep way for the mutual benefit of us all. Friends, it is to our ultimate benefit if we confess our sins to one another, if we pray for each other. And you may say, whoa, 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 hang on there, hang on, John, I, I'm not ready to wear, you know, my sins, my dirty linen in public, especially when my sin has, has nothing to do with anyone else. And I would say, well, yeah, you're right. You're right because the biblical position on, on confessing our sins is that first and foremost, we confess our sin to Almighty God. And we do that between us and him. We do it in secret. And there is no need to talk to others about that if it doesn't directly affect them. But the biblical position on confessing sin is also this. That if we have done something wrong to our Christian brother or sister, and if we desire their forgiveness, then we need to confess that sin to them and pray with them. And maybe you are here tonight and, and deep down, actually, you're sick. Maybe you've been doing a good job at, at covering it up for weeks, maybe months, maybe even years now. But deep down, your soul is sick, either with, with bitterness or with guilt. Now, I don't know what your situation is, but if it involves a brother or a sister in Christ and, and you are unwilling to address it through confession and through prayer together, then eventually it will work its way out in some negative form. An unhealthy habit, perhaps. Maybe depression. Maybe stress. Maybe anger. Maybe even physical illness as well. But can you see, it doesn't have to be that way. Praying for one another, James says, enables uh, and heals and restores true fellowship. Fifthly, praying for one another is a source of great power. This is the second part of uh, verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Sadly, however, it is often an untapped source of great power. The original word here uh, used means like an inherent strength, a potency that is, that is just waiting to be released. Think of it a bit like a, a Formula One racing car, if you like, on the grid. Lewis Hamilton in the cockpit. There is such potential power in the mechanics of, of that Mercedes in the skill of Lewis Hamilton. But if there's no fuel in the tank, it's going nowhere off the grid. And similarly, if we don't commit to the fuel of, of praying for each other, the immense power of God may not be released. I mean, sure, prayer in, in the world's eyes, it, it looks nowhere near as impressive as a, as a shiny Mercedes Formula One car. And sure, sometimes we can think, you know, are my words actually making any difference here when, when I pray? But this is exactly why James wants to remind us that prayer is an untapped source of great power because we don't think of it in that way. Now, we may be tempted to think that when James says that the, the prayer of a righteous person has, has great power, then that actually rules us out, it rules me out, and, and my, my feeble praying, you know, it just rules us out, out of the running. Well, no, because lastly, praying for one another is something that everyone can do. Praying for one another is something that everyone can do. Verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. In other words, James says, if Elijah can do it, you can do it. Anyone can. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that me and you, we, we can't really be put in that same category as, as Elijah. I mean, there's just no comparison. He was, a, he was a superhuman follower of the one true God, wasn't he? Really? Is that really true? I love how one commentator on this passage corrected me. He, he, put the, he wrote this. He says, Elijah could raise to the heights of faith and commitment, 
and fall into the depths of despair and depression. He could be brave and resolute sometimes and then fly for his life at the whiff of danger at others. He could be selfless in his concern for others and then filled with self-pity himself. Can we not relate to all of those kind of contradictions in our own lives? This is who an average, ordinary Christian is. It, it, it's you, it's me. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And James wants to encourage us that praying for each other means asking the great power to come and change things in any and every circumstance in order that our needs are met, both our spiritual and our physical needs, and that true fellowship is enabled and, and, and where necessary, restored. It's something that everyone can do. So how? How then should we pray for one another? This is our second main heading tonight, how to pray for each other. And I'm going to take it as read that most of us here um, aren't actually in the position of thinking that we've got prayer sussed. I'm also assuming that when it comes to praying for one another, most of us wish we could pray more effectively uh, and, and with greater insight. I mean, maybe you can relate to feeling slightly dissatisfied when you pray something like this. You know, you, you're there, you're saying, Lord, please would, you, please would you just be with them? Or please would you just bless them? Do you know what I mean? And of course, in one sense, there's nothing wrong with those prayers, is there? Although the Lord has actually promised to, to be with us. He's promised that. That is going to happen. He is with us. But if, if those sort of prayers, if they just, just be with them and they just bless them sort of prayers are all that we're able to muster each time we, we, we pray for each other, then it's not only dissatisfying for us individually, but it frustrates the growth and the strengthening of the Lord's kingdom. So here are a few biblical guidelines, guidelines on, uh, on how we can pray for each other. Firstly, and I think most importantly, we need to know and we need to pray scripture. If we want to pray according to God's will for each other, then we need to look no further than what he has already revealed to us about how to do that through his word. Anytime you want to pray for a brother or a sister in Christ, I don't think you can go far wrong by praying the words and examples that God has already uh, given us. I quoted Paul at the start. And his letter to the Ephesians, uh, sorry, that was the Colossians, but his letter to the Ephesians is, is an absolute goldmine for prayer. In fact, just flip back to, to page 976 and Ephesians chapter 1. Page 976 and Ephesians 1. And if you want to pray faithfully for a Christian friend, a, a Christian f a family member or, or, or work colleague, whoever it might be, this is a great place to start. If you look down at verse, uh, verse 17... And you, just, you have a person in mind, you pray, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give this person a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. See that? Or, or, or verse, verse 18, the name of the person that's in your mind. You know, Martin, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened, that you may know the hope to which you have been called. Or another name, you know, Sally, I pray that you would know that the riches, of his glory, uh, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. See how, how, how straightforward that, that, that can be? Or just, just on the opposite page, Ephesians 3, uh, 14, following, I mean, uh, that's a great place. I mean, that's a great communal prayer. Pray for all of JPC that we may, he may grant us to be strengthened with power through his spirit in our inner being. That Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we may be rooted and, and grounded in love. Strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the height, the breadth, the length, the depth of God's love for us. And that we may be, indeed be filled with all the fullness of God. It's rich. There are just so many God-glorifying, Christ-centered prayers in the New Testament. I've put some up on the screen if you want to take, take a note of them there. Ephesians 1, 3, Colossians, Philippians, 1 Thessalonians 3, they're up on the screen. 2 Thessalonians 1 is another example. And also up on the screen there are a, a, a host of useful resources and books to draw your attention to. I mean, the first is this. It's a printed sheet. I've put some at the back of, of church. It's just an A5 sheet. Uh, I've me recently been made aware of this. This is a, a list, 31 things that you can pray for your children, for example. One for each day. Uh, of the month. They're there to take them if it's helpful. Two books there. Five things to pray for your church. Five things to pray for the people you love. 
Three other books, they're essentially the same uh, intercessions for her uh, and him, uh, wife, husband, and, and setting their hope in God, biblical intercession for your children. They're effectively the same book, just reprinted in different ways with the same biblical prayers for your family members. They all take this idea of knowing and praying scripture. And once you, once you can do that, once you know scripture, you can take confidence that you will pray according to it. So secondly, on how to pray, pray specifically and pray regularly. If, as we've seen, prayer covers every circumstance, then there is no area or topic that is off limits. And therefore, prayer in general needs to kind of be the, the, the rhythm of our life, the, the beat of our heart, you know, the, the air that we breathe, but that doesn't just happen. We need to establish and cultivate a good discipline of a, of a regular time, a regular place, um, a specific list of people and things to pray for. Some people use a notebook. Some people might use their phone. There's, a, there's a, an, an app called Prayer Mate. If you haven't come across that, it's a great way of, of tracking what, who and what you're praying for. I use a, a little printed A5 booklet which has a, a list of uh, regular things I want to pray for, Bible verses, space for me to make notes, and I keep that tucked in my Bible. But that doesn't matter. Whatever it is, however we use our aids, we need to be praying specifically and regularly. Now, I know this just sounds like me saying, we need to do this. We, we, we must do this. But please just think about this for a moment. I'm not talking about some legalistic response here. If we just, you know, if we just follow what John's saying, then, then we'll be all right with God. No, it is an, I hope it's an honest recognition that even with a changed heart and even with our minds being renewed, prayer is still hard and we need help. And there's no ducking the issue that in life, anything that is of value requires action. It requires discipline on our part. You know, we, just simply we get up in the morning, we engage in the activities of the day. We, whatever it is we're going to do through the day, what gets us up, it's setting of the alarm. We need to be disciplined to set that alarm. It's action. You know, we prepare our food, we, we make our sandwiches for the day, we prepare our dinner in the evening, whatever it may We can do that because we've taken the action of going to the supermarket and buying our food. It's action. So it is in life, so it is with our prayer life. And when foundational regular disciplines are in place, then praying for each other regularly throughout the day follows much more naturally and, and much more effectively. The third guideline I have uh, tonight is, is uh, well, to coin a famous sportswear brand is just do it. <laughs> just do it. Just get on and, and pray. Let me take you back to uh, verse uh, 17 of James 5. Back onto page 1013. And we read in verse 17 of James 5 there that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. Now, actually, in the Greek, prayed fervently is literally, with prayer he prayed. And actually, the meaning is not the intensity or, or the frequency with which he paid, but prayed, but simply that he just did it. He just had the faith to do it. With prayer he prayed. That's all we need. A little bit of faith. In a, in a, in a ginormous, a loving, a, a, an all-powerful God. That's all we need. Just a little bit of faith in him. That all loving, all powerful God who is waiting to answer the prayers of his people as we pray for each other. Let's do that now in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please would you help us? Help us to know your word and to pray according to it. Help us to pray specifically for each other. Help us to, to cultivate good discipline in that. And Lord, help us to just to do that, just to get on and pray. And praying like Paul, Father, following his example, please would our love abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that we may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus, Jesus Christ. And we pray that to the glory and praise of God's name. Amen. Oh, 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 oh,